what's your downright scariest real life story? I always parked in a certain spot at my last job for 12 years that I was there. It was accessible to the public as it wasn't company parking, but they wanted us to park in the back of the lot so that closer spots could be available for customers. One day my spot's taken by a dark tinted caddy and I'm immediately pissed because everyone knows it's mine. It's morning shift so 4am. So it can't be one of the others cause I know what they drive. So Nibby, or maybe another employee from another shop in the plaza, it's still there on my lunch break. And when I go home, and the next day I come in at 1pm till close, around 9.30, and then also the next. Something about it really bothered me. It smelled wrong. Literally, it's the south and high summer, and who knows what's baking in there. My dad was a marine then a police officer. He always said, if you feel something is wrong there probably is. So I dialed in on emergency contact police number. I felt like an idiot, but every time I walked by it bugged me. So, I was stuck waiting for over an hour, before anyone shows and honestly, if I hadn't been off the next day would have been like F it. But I waited, mostly because I can be really a petty sob and that's my spot damn it. The police show. All annoyed because who knows how many they can't park here calls they get. They run the license plate though, and then things go crazy. They want my info, want me to contact my manager, does this lot have cameras, have I touched the car, etc. Apparently the car is on amber alert as the last sighting of a missing person who was a minor, a 15 years old girl. When they pop the trunk they find her dead, mutilated body under a blanket and the source of the smell. She had gone out with her much older controlling and insecure boyfriend, but had decided to get out of the relationship. She only made the mistake of getting into the car with him. He drove three counties over after torturing her, stuffing her in there, and who knows what else, then parked and walked away, left her to die in the trunk. I never learned her time of death so it haunts me sometimes thinking she might have been saved, if I'd made a fuss earlier. So yeah, listen to your gut, even if it seems petty. I was home alone. When I was 11, I had just fallen asleep and someone tried to break in the front door. I called 911 and hid in the pantry in the bottom shelf. They came to the door next to the pantry and tried to break into that door too. The police got there and one of them picked me up and held me until my mom got there. I wouldn't let go and he made sure I felt safe. I'm 27 and haven't stayed home alone much since. The day I signed a lease for my first apartment I got a dog so I wouldn't be alone. It's pretty traumatizing when you're that young. I used to sleepwalk when I was a child. We lived in a rough neighborhood, Decatur, Gap, and I would wake up outside in the middle of the night, not knowing how I got there, and would have to walk home and walk into the darkened doorway I had left wide open for whoever might be lurking around. However, the time that scared me the most was when I was about 9 years old. I woke up and found myself with the bedroom curtains drawn back and staring out the window. As I came awake, I noticed a very large and completely hairless man, no hair, eyebrows etc, staring at me and slowly inching closer to the window and closer to my face. He was looking bewildered, like he wasn't sure what he was seeing. At that moment, I realized what was going on and I started screaming uncontrollably, frozen in place and peeing down my leg. The man freaked out and screamed, did a tumbling move, and then ran off in a weird zigzag, like he was trying to dodge bullets. My mom woke up, and thought I probably had a nightmare. The next morning we found a screwdriver on the front porch and damage to the door jam and door handle. I still just about pee my pants, when I tell that story, but now it is usually from laughing. I will never forget the look on his face, when I started coming to life, and screaming or his high pitched scream or his duck and roll and dodging and bobbing all the way down the street. Years ago in one of my first jobs, a colleague told me a story, the night before. She had gone out for some drinks, and on the way home she had got off the bus, and was walking down her road to her house. A taxi pulled up alongside her, and the driver told her to get in the car. She obviously said no. He then said to her call whoever you want whilst you're in the car, but please just get in, and I'll explain. So she got in. Turns out, walking towards her was a topless guy with no shoes on and a machete in his hand. Cab driver had already called the police, but then saw my colleague so had stopped to look after her. 
was with a guy for a couple of years, when I realized that he'd taken up smoking meth as a hobby after work, we had numerous problems already, and I had three small kids, so I finally kicked him out, a few days later, maybe a week, he makes a fake Facebook page, and sends me a friend request, the only posts on the page, were talking about killing me and my children, his suicide, and how he planned to do it that day, the most recent post was accompanied by a selfie of him in my backyard, a recent selfie, so he had been there, I was on my way home with the kids late in the evening, when I got the request, I had stopped by my parents home the day before, and gotten my dad's 9mm handgun, because he was sending messages through mutual friends about burning my house down, I called the police, as soon as I got home, and they didn't seem to think it was a big deal, and didn't have an officer available to come check my house, before we walked into it, I live in the middle of the woods, and we have a rinky dink police force, anyway, I made the kids stay in the car, I gave my oldest instructions on what to do if anything happened, and I had to sweep my own home, in the dark, with a 9mm in case he was in there waiting for me and my children, and it was terrifying. I had to check my entire house every time we came home for a while, and I was always worried that I'd eventually find him in there. Police were called numerous times, and I was eventually granted a restraining order a couple weeks later, when the death threats continued. He died about a year ago and all I felt was relief. When I first learned that some of the nicest people out there can be dealing with some terrible demons, when I was younger about around second or third grade, I had a math tutor at the time. She was my mom's friend from Anonymous Alchaholics, which didn't really understand it at the time. She was a really nice lady and the reason I'm so good with math even till this day. One of the days she was supposed to come over, my mother couldn't get a hold of her. So my mom got concerned, and we took a ride over to check on her to see if she was okay. When we got to her place, we found her so drunk, laying on the floor, and couldn't even stand. My mom had to call an ambulance. Later that day my mom had to explain to me what happened, and that she had passed away, taught me that day, no matter how good things look on the outside for some people, the demons on the inside, could just be moments away from taking them. I was rushing to a lab class, had books in one hand, lunch in the other, and attempted to walk downstairs into the lab, except the steps were old cement steps with metal lips, and the tip of my foot caught the lip. I went head first, never touched anything the entire way down, until I landed on my neck against the wall at the bottom of the stairs. I felt my entire weight load into my neck, and every single vertebrate popped. I knew I was dead. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. Everyone rushed out of the lab to see what happened. Apparently it was loud point I was 300 pounds at the time, and then all got the sudden the breath rushed back into my lungs, and I could breath, and move. I got up, it felt miraculous, ended up with occasional severe back pain that eventually went away after 18 months or so. When I was 17 my mom's husband had this mental breakdown, and attempted to end her. I was recovering from knee surgery at the time, but still ran from my room, to see what was going on. My baby brother who was 4 at the time, was in the room, when he was choking and stomping on her, and I had took him out the room and told my other siblings to leave the house, and get someone to call the cops. I had to tackle him to get him off her, and had pinned him up against the washer and dryer, and yelled at her to leave. I had tried to lock him in their room to leave the house, and look for my siblings and he just pushed me, and went into the kitchen to grab a knife. He was trying to hurt himself, because in the small time frame I had called the cops, while on the phone he looked me in the eyes, and started to cut himself, and then locked himself in the bathroom since he figured he would be arrested, if he was gone. What scared me the most was how calm he was, when he said she's cheating on me so, if I can't have her no one else will as I was screaming at him. I have no idea how I had got him off her, because he was 6 feet 3 and 300 somethings lbs. I'm 21 now, and to this day I get jumpy around knives and panic, when I don't hear from my mom, after she leaves the house. I was active duty in the navy, served aboard a submarine, we were in port one day, most the crew had left, the guys on duty for the night, that's us, were given permission to bring our kids on board for dinner, halfway through the meal, someone makes a 4MC announcement, 4MC is the emergency announcement intercom thing, says there's light smoke in the engine room, quickly followed by fire in the engine room, 
we train for this stuff religiously so everyone is immediately in action. Commanding officer is still there but top side. One of our senior enlisted guys apparently ran the kids up front to a hatch where he was, quite literally, throwing them through the hatch as our co caught them, and set them on the deck top side. The rest of us ran toward the fire and I see no one grabbing a mask, not one person. So I grabbed a big handful of breathing masks, and follow through the hatch, where we are greeted by what appeared to be a light smoke filling the entire engine room. But it didn't smell like smoke, it was sweet, tasted sweet, an oil pump had blown and filled the entire back half of the boat with atomized hydraulic fluid, a guy was moments from lighting a torch in the engine room as the casualty was called. Had it been called just a moment later, we'd have walked into an inferno, had he for some reason, not heard it called, and let the torch when, after we had run in, we'd have been on fire, before we could react, turned out perfectly fine, cleaned the oil, that clung to all the surfaces, and fixed the pump, but it was somewhat surreal, understanding just how close we were to a wildly different result. A year ago I was hospitalized with an infection in my right lower leg, they drew a line a few inches below my knee and said if the infection spreads past this line I'll lose my leg below the knee. They pumped me full of antibiotics, and it seemed to work. I had to finish my antibiotics regimen at a nearby rehab hospital. The day before I was transferred my roommate, and I were eating breakfast. He was an older gentleman, and when he slept he made a weird gurgling noise. He said to a passing nutritionist, that his breakfast should have come with two coffees I heard. That gurgling noise at the foot of his bed behind the curtain that separated us. This was still during COVID. I was about to call a nurse when one ran in asking if he was okay. The guy was coding. All of a sudden our room had nurses and a doctor running in to save this guy. It was controlled chaos. Procedures and medicines being used, being pulled out. One nurse kept track of everything on a laptop. I couldn't go anywhere. I was in the bed closet to the window. They kept pushing me closer to the window so more people could help him. They worked on him for over an hour. They called the time of death shortly afterwards. The doctor asked for a moment of silence. He saw me sitting up in my bed and came over and asked if I was alright. I said I was. Even though I had tears in my eyes, other nurses kept asking if I needed anything. These people took time out to see if I was okay after what I just witnessed. I asked one of the nurses to open the window a bit. She smiled and understood what I meant. It was a sunny day and very peaceful outside the window. Even now typing this out a year later it brings tears to my eyes. I heard someone's final words on this earth. Excuse me miss, but my breakfast was supposed to come with two coffees. Went to therapy with my first husband. He went on and on about how I was a bad wife. When it was my turn I just said I would like him to stop hitting me and dragging me across the floor. He wasn't happy. The therapist asked me to attend the next session alone. Husband wanted to know what I told the therapist. I can't even remember what I said. When we got home, he took my keys, pager, glasses and tried to lock me in the bedroom. He also had the landline cut off. It took two tries, but I finally escaped with what I could fit in my car. This was 20 plus years ago. I still have nightmares. He constantly told me if I left him. He would kill me, so I'm glad I got out. I was 14. When we started dating he was in his mid-twenties and a friend of my dad's. Being fully homeless for a period. A lot of people think homeless means hobo on the streets, but it can also mean that you're always couch surfing or staying with family and this was usually my situation with occasional rented homes on short-term leases that I would usually end up being unable to pay for but then for about a week I was literally homeless sleeping on the streets, and having to find cover while it rained. I didn't even have much more than multiple coats, and mostly slept in tennis huts at my local public park. It was terrifying tbh, and I really wanted to die, just to get out of it. There is a happy ending though, I've been married, and a home me are with for a while and I'll never be in that position again. Early to mid 90s in Northern Ireland, I was a kid of around 8 or 9, the sun was shining. And it was sometime in the early afternoon. My dad needed to return a library book in the Shankill, a Protestant slash loyalist area in Belfast. We were Catholics, and the Shankill was notoriously dangerous at the time, still is to a lesser extent. So I was already a little on edge, just knowing the reputation of the place. My dad was cool though, didn't seem worried or anything. 
It's not like we have Catholic printed on our foreheads. He did say, however, that I had to pretend to have a different name. If anyone asked me, my name is one which marks you as a Catholic. So I adopted a Protestant name for the trip. We came to a road which lead to an intersection, across which was a predominantly Catholic slash Republican enclave. We were headed to the right, down a long winding path, but further up the road ahead, towards the intersection, we could see a group of men. One of them was running back and forth across the road, relaying information between two pockets of people. Some were staring across the road towards the Catholic area, some were talking to a man in a parked but running car. One in particular stuck out. He had long hair and a leather jacket, and was very tall, at least compared to the other men. It all looked suspicious even to me as a child, although I didn't know why, but my dad's demeanor changed to a more serious and quiet one, and I took it as confirmation that we weren't safe. He was from Belfast. We were living in a town outside of Belfast at the time, and grew up when things were at their worst here, so he knew the ropes and knew the signs that something was happening. We weren't walking towards the men, so it wasn't a problem. We crossed to the right and started walking away. This is when a woman approached us. She was middle-aged with short red hair. She saw us coming and made a purposeful beeline towards us. She seemed preoccupied, nervous. She started grilling my dad immediately, asking who he was and where he was coming from. She was talking in a run trying my best to sound casual, but I'm failing manner. I could feel my entire body beginning to boil with fear, and I felt as though I was mere moments away from being discovered. It was like a horror movie, where someone finds themselves in a small town, where everyone is in a cult or something, and they are trying to blend in, but are drawing suspicion, and are losing themselves in an ever-increasing paranoia. I suddenly had visions of my dad getting shot and me screaming over his corpse, maybe even getting shot myself despite being a child. The longer my dad and the woman talked, the more I was starting to lose the ability to hear. As though my head was underwater, I was holding my dad's hand, and I was struggling to keep a grip because of the sweat pumping out of my palm. I didn't know how or why, but something primal in me recognized that we were in serious danger. It was clear that she was a part of whatever was going on around the corner and was trying to manage and analyze the flow of foot traffic especially that of strangers like us. Given that she and us were the only people on the street, she had been doing a good job. She was fishing hard for information about us. My dad played it cool and responded to her questions without really revealing much, doing a much better job of being casual than she was. The area we were from, he explained, was mixed that is, Protestant and Catholic, and he feigned displeasure at that fact trying to signal that he hated Catholics and was somewhat miffed to have to live amongst them without ever actually using those words. It was subtle and I was terrified that I might need to participate in the conversation because there's no way I could dance around the truth as well as my dad was doing. He explained that he was just here to return a book which he showed her as proof. She asked about me, my name, and I gave her the fake name. She surely read the terror in my face, and could hear it in my voice. My dad decided, that that was the time to break off, and say nice to meet you, all the best, and started walking away with me. I could sense, that the woman didn't budge, and just stood, and stared at us as we walked away. I glanced over my shoulder, after about 30 seconds, and just caught a glimpse of her turning and walking towards the road, where the men were gathered. We rounded a corner, and were now at the top of a very long and steep road slash path with a library at the very bottom of it. The path was fenced on one side, and on the other side was a row of houses. It felt like we were walking deeper into danger, and that we had only two routes of escape. Keep going, or turn back the way we came. About part way down the road, we realized we were being followed. My dad told me to run ahead, and check that the library was opened, and I hesitated. He said it was okay, and to just go and check. I glanced over my shoulder, it was the man in the leather jacket with the long hair. I did what my dad wanted and ran ahead, heart pounding and ears pricked awaiting the crack of gunfire. I checked the door was opened, and I ran back up. As I was coming back I saw, that the man in the leather jacket had turned, and was making his way back up the road. My dad looked unfazed, but was walking with a certain rigidity, like something had happened in the time it took me to run to the library and back again. 
and he hadn't quite unclenched his fists yet. He said it was okay, and we were safe. I asked about the man following us, he said he sent me ahead, and when I was a safe distance away, he stopped and turned around to face him, ready for whatever happened. He said he was expecting violence, but as he turned around, the leather jacket dude immediately put his head down, turned, and walked back the way he came. My dad watched him for a few seconds, and then started making his way back towards me. That afternoon, within the hour we were there, a Catholic taxi driver was murdered in that street. The vibes that something terrible was going to happen were justified, and I've never felt as terrified as I did that day. When the news about the taxi driver was on TV that night, I knew I had seen the planning of murder and I knew we had walked into the middle of it. I could probably have identified both the woman and the leather jacket man had I been asked about them by the police. But that was never going to happen. No way my dad would have volunteered himself, and therefore me, to the cops to be a witness against a terrorist cell.